to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to live. I'm going to live. If I Live Until Morning, A True Story of Adventure, Tragedy, and Transformation is a memoir about Jean Bunchrath's life. Jean shares inspiring and instructional wisdom gained from her real life triumph over tragedy. from Trending, Who, What, Where, and When. Today, I will be speaking with author Jean Muntrath, inspirational speaker and Amazon best-selling author about her book, If I Live Until Morning, A True Story of Adventure, Tragedy, and Transformation. Jean will be joining us from Estes Park, Colorado, USA. I'm Jean Muntrath, currently exploring the wilds of Escalante, Utah, but I live in the mountains of Estes Park, Colorado. In my memoir, If I Live Until Morning, I'll take you on a 200-mile wilderness ski trip and a five-day survival epic. We'll go to the Andes of Patagonia, the jungles of Thailand, and the Himalayas in Nepal in India. I'll give insights into Tibetan Buddhist culture, healing trauma, and working as an adventure travel guide. So I'd start by asking you where you would take friends or family when they come to visit you in Estes Park, Colorado. Well, where I take people at visit kind of depends on who they are and what their capabilities are, because we do live at high altitude. My home is at 8,000 feet, and I've got mountains up to 14,000 feet in my backyard. So altitude is a bit of a consideration with people's health. Um, always include a, a drive up Trail Ridge Road, which is the highest continuously paved road in North America, way above tree line. And so everybody has to see that. Uh, that's in Rocky Mountain National Park. And then if one is able to hike, I certainly enjoy taking them on a hike that might be tailored to their interests or their needs. Um, there's like a, oh, 150 lakes or so in the immediate area. So there's plenty of lakes and forests and beautiful mountains to see. Okay, well, please tell us about your book, If I Live Until Morning. Well, the essence of the story starts off with a 200-mile wilderness ski expedition on the John Muir Trail in California, which is over 200 miles, as I mentioned. And then that ends in a near-death um, mountaineering accident on Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the continental United States, and then a five-day survival epic. And on the mountain, um, I was very close to death, as I mentioned, and I made this vow to myself, and that vow was if I live until morning, hence the title of my book, I will live my greatest dreams. And so um, those dreams were to travel around the world, particularly to the Himalayas. And so a good part of the book is dedicated to traveling all around the world and following my dreams. And then the last part of the book is 
um, dealing with the traumas that come back to haunt me physically and emotional and how that kind of transformed me. So in sharing my own stories, I hope to kind of reveal the power of places and cultures we encounter and peoples and traumas and how all of that can shape our lives and who we are. So I like to think of my book as something deeper than just um, an adventure travel story. I think in its larger context as a memoir, it's an inspiring story about being able to overcome life's adversities and challenges and then get on and live life to the fullest. Okay. You did have that in your book. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> what is the John Muir Trail? Trail that goes through the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. It's very, very rugged terrain. Uh, it's over 200 miles and it crosses about 10 passes from 10,000 to 13,000 feet in elevation. And on our trip, we actually added four more passes, three and 14 passes. And that's because we had some pre-placed food caches that we had to ski into the mountains. Um, so we had food one week apart waiting for us um, in the wilderness. And we did this uh, trip, not during the summer, but during the winter on skinny Nordic skis. I have one of the skis behind us and our very <laughs> small boots. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we did this over the course of just a couple of weeks. It was just under a month and really stupendous, rugged scenery. And the John Muir Trail obviously was named for John Muir, the great conservationist who helped to establish many of our Western national parks. And this trail is actually part of the greater Pacific Crest Trail that goes from the border of Mexico and the U.S. all the way to the Canadian border. Why did you write this book? <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of funny because for like three decades, I had friends who knew my story tell me, you should write a book. And I, I didn't really feel ready or even necessarily wanting to. But at some point in my life, I had been dealing with chronic pain um, for like 18 years. And I was really desperate to heal on a lot of different levels. So I went to see a trauma therapist. And then he said to me, I think you should write a book. I think it would help you heal. And at that point, I just kind of threw up my arms like, okay, I have heard this so many times. I'm going to write down my story. So I didn't write it with the intention of publishing it, to be honest. I just wrote it to heal myself. And when it was said and done, I realized this was really a powerful story. And I wanted to share it with others because I felt maybe it could inspire others or benefit others in some way. So I went ahead and published it at that point. And um, I'm really glad I did. It's been a, quite a personal journey that's evolved after that. Was it difficult to delve into the many layers of trauma while writing your story? Oh, it was. <laughs> um, you know, that was part of my whole healing process is, um, I think the one thing I've really learned about trauma, whether that's physical, emotional, or both, um, is that if we don't face it and start unraveling these different layers of pain and difficulty that everyone has their own stories, right? Their own Mount Whitney's, their own challenges. And if we don't really deal with those, um, we're going to be haunted by them. They're going to follow us. And we keep trying to push them down, right? And oh, they'll just go away if I don't give them the time of day. But the truth is they keep coming back. They want to be heard. They want to be released. And so for me, diving into that was very healing. And I think what happened for me on a couple of levels was um, as I was writing my book, I was forced to revisit things. And I started to get really curious about Mount Whitney because uh, I didn't think I'd ever go back to Mount Whitney. I mean, I didn't know I'd be physically able to, but just emotionally. And so I wound up getting on Google Earth because I became very curious about, well, where exactly did I fall? And where are my skis that I abandoned and that thing? And anyway, so I started getting on Google Earth and I had never used Google Earth before. This was the first time. And it was kind of traumatic in the beginning because I was learning you know, to use the keyboard with Google Earth and I'd find where I fell and I would lose control of the keyboard, I'd be sliding over the cliffs, you know, on the screen. And, and it was really difficult. Like it would be this, <gasps> you know, when that would happen, because I would relive a little bit that. But ultimately, that made me curious enough that I really wanted to go back to Mount Whitney. And I think that was very healing, because I had to really face the place where I nearly died and the trauma. And um, I also realized on that mountain when I went back that a key component of my healing is I hadn't forgiven myself for the decision I had made there that resulted in so much pain and um, this effort to survive. And that was really important. So it was good. I believe the main messages I have are kind of two things. Um, 
One is I really want to inspire people to recognize how short and precious life is and not to keep putting off your dreams because you may not have a chance to live those dreams. And the truth is when we're all on our deathbed, we're not going to wish we had worked more okay we are going to wish that we spent more quality time with those that we love and cherish and we're going to wish that we followed through on whatever our personal dreams are and so i really want people to think about get moving and get those dreams accomplished whatever they are you know and then secondly as i mentioned earlier i, I believe we all have our own personal challenges in life and i want to gently encourage readers to reflect on those and that if I can get through all the obstacles I've dealt with in my life. They can heal theirs. They can get on with that. And then I feel like if people can heal whatever ails them and find the courage to deal with that, then they can live life more fully and more beautifully. And that's my wish in putting my book out there. Have you had any memorable conversations with readers of your book that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I certainly have. Uh, you know, I do get emails occasionally, and I love hearing from readers of, about my book and how it touched them. You know, some have just mentioned they've had their own um, mountaineering or other accidents, and they found um, that maybe they should try some other healing modalities. So that's been inspiring for them. And I had one woman that um, reached out from Great Britain, actually, and uh, she told me, I was a little bit in shock, but she said, you know, I realized after reading your book how unhappy I was in my relationship. And she actually left her partner, moved across Great Britain with her kids to start a new life. And then the last story, but perhaps the most personally touching story was um, a member of a local book club asked me to go to a house of a friend of hers who had read my book here in Estes Park and talk with this woman. Um, she was addicted to painkillers. And I went over to her house having no idea what the evening would hold and hoping I could find the magical things to say to ease her pain. And she came to me and she um, <clears throat> immediately rolled her pant leg up and just showed me a leg covered with scars and traumas from multiple surgeries and car accidents and described her story and her physical and emotional pain. and. It was so rewarding to spend the evening with her and talk one on one about dealing with pain and trying to find ways that might be able to help her personally. We talked about what was important to her in life and her mountain view of Long's Peak was important as it is to me. And she painted a lot, but she had given that up. And so we talked about how to use those things as either a meditation practice or a healing practice so that she could kind of get out of her self pity and her own pain and move past that. It was really meaningful for both of us. You get a real range of inquiries. <laughs> yes, I do. But I think that's because my book covers a lot of yeah. territory, if you will, <laughs> personal and you know external as well. Could you select three or four pull quotes from your book to read and explain to us? Uh, yeah, I think the one I really like is um, death changed everything. And the context for me with that is uh, reflecting on how much an encounter with death at a young age, I was 22 years of age when I had this mountaineering accident and how that really inspired me to want to live my dreams. And uh, literally I've spent all of my life pursuing different dreams and turning them into transformative experiences. And most of those have involved some international travel, but that's been very powerful for me. And then another pull quote I would say is, um, I made this vow. If I live until morning, I will live my greatest dreams, which I believe I referred to earlier. And then another one that comes to mind is, um, I'm going to live, I'm going to live, I'm going to live. And that was a personal mantra that just bubbled up inside me when I was laying at 13,000 feet, bleeding in our tent for several days. and. I was not likely to live and, and I knew that, but um, I kept saying that mantra for days, literally, unless I was sleeping or talking to my skiing partner, that's what was being repeated in my head. And I believe I sent that intention out into the universe that I was gonna survive at all, all costs. I was just gonna make it and it helped me get out. Is there any passage from your book that you'd like to read and share with us? 
Yes, I um, actually have two. I'm um, fairly short. Um, I'll give you the context. Uh, the first one is uh, shortly after my fall on Mount Whitney and I'm at 13,000 feet and it is uh, kind of twilight and I have just had this accident. I reached up and gently wiped the blood away from my eyes. Despite my injuries, I was awed by the sight across the valley. As the sun set to the west, long shafts of golden light filtered through the dark clouds over Mount Russell. This is a beautiful place to die, I thought while lying helplessly in the cold snow. As the light faded from the peak, I wondered if the light of my own life would be extinguished next. I gazed at Mount Russell with such intensity that the image became burned forever into my memory. And then moving forward, um, I'm in Nepal in a place called the Annapurna Sanctuary. Uh, it's a, a glacial cirque surrounded by high Himalayan peaks, the centerpiece being Annapurna, which is uh, 26,500 and some feet tall. And so the difference between where I'm physically standing and the summit of the mountain is 13,000 feet. So a, a lot of relief, it's hard to imagine. After dark, I returned outside to intoxicate myself with the overwhelming beauty. A full moon was already high in the night sky. It bathed the peaks in stunning silver light. Annapurna was aptly named the goddess of abundance. In this glacial cirque, she bestowed a gift more, more lasting than any riches. She offered a sanctuary for the human spirit. Here, I was utterly at peace. For a moment, I felt whole again. Before returning to the bamboo shack, I touched my heart and bowed to the divine peaks with gratitude. Thank you. Could you share with us what you learned from your experience that was detailed in your book and what you do differently now after having had these experiences? I learned a lot. <laughs> um, let me start with what I would do differently. Um, kind of two things come to mind. Uh, one is maybe I should have started our ascent of the peak earlier in the day. Uh, a variety of reasons made us start later than we should have. And uh, I should have entertained the idea of going back the way we came. Uh, that would have extended our expedition by one day, but as it turned out, having an accident extended it by five days and I've lived with it all my life. So, you know, that would have been a good change to make. But I've learned a lot of things about how to live life. And I think the most important lesson I learned was the power of our minds. And again, I, I said that mantra, as I mentioned, and when I started self-evacuating, because nobody came to get us out of the mountains, it took, you know, five days from the summit till we got to a hospital. And um, I would just believe that I could do this. And I, I really believe that my mind is the essence of what kept me alive. And then another lesson I learned, as I've mentioned, is to just to live your life the fullest, follow your dreams. And kind of an example of that, I already shared my vow, but when we were coming out of the mountains, you know, I have fractures all over my spine and my pelvis, and I have 35 pounds on my back, and I'm sinking thigh deep in snow and crossing a mountain pass and really difficult conditions. And occasionally I would just collapse and think, okay, I, I'm not going to make it. And then I would remember my dream of seeing the Himalayas and my vow, and I would just force myself to get up and keep on going because um, it gave me purpose um, to live for. And then another thing I learned is that... Um, you know, we all have our own plans and hopes for life, but sometimes the universe has other plans for us and things don't always go the way we want them to. So I've learned the value of having to be open to new directions in life and that that can also bring some benefit, you know, so if you don't get your way, maybe there's a reason for that and be open to what might unfold. I've learned the importance of forgiveness of self and others, um, particularly for myself, because it was really hard to acknowledge the, my poor decision making and the consequences of that. And I think the other thing I've really learned is to celebrate life. Every day, I think it's important to, to feel gratitude um, for another day, to express gratitude to those around us that are always helping us in one way or another, a small or large. And actually to celebrate one's birthdays and embrace them. And I don't make a big deal when my birthday comes around, but I've really always taken a moment to acknowledge, wow, I just got another year in life. And, you know, I've been surrounded by so many women that complain like, oh, I'm 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever. I'm like, 
I, I just always want to stop and say, hey, celebrate that you're getting older. There's a lot of people that they don't get that extra year and it's a gift to get older, even though it has its own challenges. So those are kind of the things I've learned in a nutshell. That was um, an amazing career to have. And it's really um, wonderful to be able to live in a place and work in a place that's very beautiful and inspiring. And people come from all over the world that you get to meet and share this place with. And if you think about it, um, people come to, uh, national parks to often have those most important life events, you know, whether it's an anniversary they're celebrating or a birthday or a family reunion. So I get to be part of that in, in an indirect way and allow people to have these wondrous moments and facilitate that for them. I've had some really amazing experiences. I'll just highlight a few. Uh, you know, my favorite thing was always to give the evening programs at the campgrounds. Uh, I really enjoyed that. When I first started my career, I was working as a wilderness ranger in Glacier National Park in Montana. And I was in a very remote location. So I was stationed in this um, one room log cabin that was 15 miles by foot from the nearest road. And uh, I lived in this log cabin and it was an amazing, beautiful place. And it was so remote that I saw only 52 people the entire season. But the experience that stands out is I had my 21st birthday there. And to be honest, I woke up feeling really sorry for myself, you know, because most people have a pretty big party on their 21st. And anyway, uh, I went outside and I was eating my breakfast um, on the porch, a granola with fresh picked huckleberries. And I hear kind of a snorting sound and I, I look up and there's some bear cubs going up a tree and then the mother coming toward my cabin. And, and I wound up uh, going in my cabin and closing the doors and she circled my cabin for a long time. And then I called my boss by radio and said, uh, what do I do? And he said, well, why don't you take inventory in the cabin today? And I'm really depressed. It's my birthday. And I'm going to count matchsticks in the cabin and candles. You know, there's nothing there. So later in the day, I the bear was long gone. I thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go up to Lake Isabel where I had some work to do in the back country. And I get about a mile from my cabin and I see those cubs again. And the mother bear is about 15 feet from me. And now she's the black bear, but she's coming around and coming down the trail towards me and I I keep going down the trail you know telling myself don't run don't run don't run and eventually I climbed a tree and I stayed in that tree for two hours uh, while the tree was going back and forth like this and she circled around for two hours so that was uh, memorable and then another experience I had as a park ranger is uh, I had the good fortune of serving as the personal guide to the Empress and Empress of Japan when they visited Rocky Mountain National Park. And that was really a warm and wonderful uh, opportunity to experience these people and their graciousness and to share the park with them. And then I was also the uh, artist and resident coordinator for Rocky Mountain National Park is one of my collateral duties as a park ranger. And I really enjoyed um, hosting the park services first ever child artist in residence, a very articulate uh, and talented eight year old artist. I'm still in touch. Uh, she's getting ready to go to college now. And, and then uh, also helping a, a composer launch his uh, first world premiere orchestra performance with the Boulder Philharmonic Orchestra. And then that went on to be performed at the uh, Kennedy Arts Center for the Performing Arts. So all of those were very great highlights of my career. You were leading trekking tours in Nepal and Thailand. Mm -hmm. You had some stories about that in your book. Yeah, I do have some good stories about that. So one of the things that uh, people don't realize when they when they sign up for a tour, um, first of all, you'll get different clients depending on the type of tour in the country that you're leading. So that can vary quite a bit. But a tour guide is really on duty 24 seven, because what people don't realize is that there's a lot of unfolding crises that are going on either in front of their eyes or behind the scenes. And so I felt like um, evenings were spent staying up late, trying to make a plan B and C and D. And I had to deal with things like life-threatening medical emergencies with my clients. I had one client actually try to commit suicide in front of me by jumping off a cliff, which he didn't do, but that was <laughs> pretty uh, challenging for me. <laughs> and uh, you know, I also dealt with a lot of cultural revolutions and night curfews in countries and clients that got closed 
closed out of a country because the border closed. So half your clients were in one country and half were in the other while they were en route. And so it's just a lot of uh, challenges. But on the other hand, um, I especially enjoy guiding treks in Nepal because um, for a lot of people, this was a huge physical challenge to be hiking for a month at, you know, in the cold at high altitude and to really watch people kind of rise to the occasion of what challenges them. And then to facilitate, again, this experience that was one of their life dreams was really rewarding. But, but it is hard work. I will say it's the hardest uh, job I've ever done. I think being on a tour like that for a month would be a long time too. Yes, it is. And of course the conditions are cold and you don't get a shower and you know, all of those things. So, um, and what people don't realize too, is you're, you're dealing with all the needs of your clients. You want to keep them happy and healthy. But the other part is that you're dealing with your local staff, your support staff. And so you've got kind of these two cultures are bridging and two different sets of problems and you have to kind of make them all work out together so you can have a harmonious and successful expedition wherever you're going. Can you share some of your adventures in the mountains of Asia? Yeah, uh, you know, I've detailed a few in my book. Um, Asia and the mountains there are definitely where my passion is. And I first went to uh, the Himalayas and Nepal because I just really wanted to see these magnificent mountains. But the, the truth is, as I would return time and time again, either while I was guiding tours or just personal adventures, the culture started really touching me and changing me as well. And so I really find it's, a powerful thing to be in this kind of a mind blowing landscape of great beauty and to see how those landscapes have been shaped by the local cultures and the cultures have been affected by them in turn. And even the visitors are affected by these places. And so one of the stories that stands out for me was um, for, it's a long story, but I was in a situation where I needed to return from the, a base camp of a peak at 17,000 feet down to a remote tea house at 15,000 feet. And I was with a 15 year old Nepali boy and his yak. <laughs> and it was getting dark. And um, we had one flashlight between us and it was barely working. And we had many miles and many hours to go. And we're crossing rugged terrain, glacial moraines, and then a large glacier, and then crossing some ice covered streams. And, and I remember the stars. It, you can't imagine the stars in the Himalayas because you're so far from lights. And the sky is pitch black. And it's so full of stars, it's beyond the imagination. It just glitter, twinkling glitter. And that was a very special night um, with Pasang. There was a language barrier. He spoke some English, but we needed each other to survive, to get down safely. And so I noticed there was this bonding that occurred with our cultures that was really remarkable. And then on another trip um, near the Himalayas, um, there's a large range that is certainly as... Um, outstanding in scenery as the Himalayas. And people don't talk about it much. It's called the Karakoram Range. It's where K2 is, the second highest mountain on earth. And um, I wasn't near K2 in this case, but I was traveling along the Karakoram Highway, which follows the southern route of the ancient Silk Road from Pakistan to Western China. And, you know, along the way, I met such gracious people. I tasted their apricots, which are a little bit different than the apricots we have here. And I will say, I have never tasted a fruit better than that. And that was in the Hunza Valley where people are said to live to a ripe old age, you know. And then pe people would come out of their homes, um, particularly the woman, which was surprising in that culture. And they would say, and I'm, I'm not gonna say this correctly, but they would use the term something like, salam alaykum, which means peace be with you. And I was really touched by that. And then as we continued on and crossed the border into Western China, I remember being beneath this big mountain called Mustak Atta, which is 25,000 feet. And we're in kind of a grassland setting and a lake and two camels come by with locals riding it. And it was literally on the route Marco Polo had ridden camels on. And it, it was just a journey back in time. And then we got to Kashgar in Southwest China. And you know, many of us travelers love to go to the markets in other countries because they're so colorful and rich and uh, so many experiences and sights and smells and things. But no market has been as amazing as the one at Kashgar. And there, there were all these different cultures coming together because it's a crossroad of cultures and trade for centuries. And the wares being sold were amazing. I remember um, 
people buying donkeys and then people taking camels out for a test drive, just like we would a car. And, and it was really remarkable. And uh, again, you know, meeting the Uyghur people and uh, tasting foods I never had and seeing silks and things. But the experience at that market that stands out for me was uh, I stumbled into a shop that was selling animal pelts. And I was taken aback by that. And I walked over to a rack that had snow leopard hides on it and I was kind of holding back the tears and I turned to the shopkeeper and I said how much for a snow leopard and he said 400 US dollars and I looked him in the eye and I said you know there are people that would pay 400 dollars to see them alive in the Himalayas not dead just so you know you know and then I walked out and then another memory I have is actually I had been in Tibet for a while and um, then I flew north to the mountains of um, the Washan mountains in China which is a very sacred mountain location it looks a lot like Yosemite Valley really tall uh, rugged uh, granite cliffs but these cliffs have um, stone steps cut into them and trails and Taoist monasteries everywhere and I took the tram up to the top of the mountains and I was on my own I really sometimes like the challenge of having to manage how do I get to a place and I don't speak the language and figure that out so I kind of thrive on that I have to admit and anyway I got up to this lodge and there was lodging all over the mountain but they were all closed because this was the autumn and uh, I wound up at a lodge that was there was no food available it was their last night open for the season this is november and i'm in this room perched over a cliff quite literally <laughs> and the next day i get up and i'm hiking up these stone cut stairs and trails and i meet these three men um chinese men they were in business suits and ties and um, dress shoes totally inappropriate attire for where we were and we i got to the top of this little staircase maybe 20 feet high and it was really steep i mean it wasn't like you were going to fall and die kind of thing but you could get injured and they got too scared and they were like no we're not doing this and so i climbed back down and of course couldn't speak a word of chinese and they couldn't speak english but through just gesturing and kind of modeling to them how to use their feet they followed me and they got up that hurdle and they were so pleased and we spent the whole day hiking together and had lunch and tea and just laughed and again we couldn't speak but we just enjoyed each other's company so i think that's kind of the power of some of these places is bringing people together to experience these rich landscapes and those are a few of my favorite memories in the mountains in asia you worked in bhutan for the yeah. world wildlife fun. Could you yeah. tell us about that experience? Uh, yeah. Um, so that was kind of a dream come true. I had already traveled to Bhutan as a tourist, but to work there is a whole nother um, type of experience. In this case, I was designing a visitor center and some exhibits for a uh, national park that was in cent the center part of Bhutan. And I lived in <laughs> this remote place at 10,000 feet uh, in the fall with a wood stove on the far end of this cabin that had wet wood so it was very cold and uh, they had slats um you know vertical slats for the structure of the cabin and i there were half inch gaps so i could literally look through the wall and uh, i had to walk like two hours a day uh round trip to the nearest village and back in order to get electricity to work on my laptop <laughs> but i really loved it because the culture was so warm and they kind of adopted me i felt like i was treated like i was family and the landscape was just stunning and the forests are pretty intact in bhutan unlike much of asia and I just so enjoyed being there and I got access to places that tourists don't get to see. And I will say that um, I loved it there so much that I really didn't want to come home. It was just a fabulous um, experience. Very rich, very wonderful. Can you tell us about your many positive experiences with the Tibetan Lamas? So I've had the good fortune of meeting Tibetan Lamas uh, both during my time in Asia as well as here in America. And um, I'll start off by sharing a few with my experiences in Asia. Um, when I was in Darjeeling, India, I would go to this beautiful monastery overlooking some of the Himalayan mountains in India. And I would go to this small temple and I went there every day to, to meditate. And um, the Lama there, Lama Tenzing, uh, decided that uh, 
he would allow me upstairs so I wouldn't get interrupted by anybody else coming in. So he took me upstairs to their private shrine room. And every day, and I showed up there for nearly two weeks, uh, he would take me up to that room and leave me alone to do my practice. I would be up there for hours. He'd come up, bring me tea, and then we would have a lunch break and he would serve me lunch. And sometimes we went out for dinner together. And it was just really special. And near the end of that time, uh, his teacher, Bokar Rinpoche, who's no longer living, um, but who's quite famous, was living about three hours away in another monastery. And he said, you know, there's this teaching that's going to be given there in private to just a few other lamas, and I want you to go. And so he made arrangements so that I could get in to this private event at this house. And um, anyway, so I had to take a Jeep to get over there. And it was just really remarkable to have that opportunity and then there were other times I was traveling in Sikkim India also in the Himalayas and um, once I met this Lama who said oh I, I feel like you should be blessed by this other Lama I'm going to travel all day tomorrow to this other monastery will you come and so I did and and that was an amazing experience and then here in America I've had some really wonderful experiences um, one is simply just having meals with llamas in their homes or having them over to my home. There was one llama from Nepal, uh, Nuba Rinpoche, and uh, he stayed in our house and gave some public teachings. And then one day we took him to Rocky Mountain National Park where we take all of our visiting llamas. And they always want to find those little special places where they can just meditate. And we were meditating out um, in a big uh, meadow called Moraine Park, and he went out to the stream there, the Big Thompson River, which is a pretty big river in Colorado, and he just went down to the river, and he started blessing it and saying prayers, and his intention was to bless that water for all the wildlife and all the people living downstream, and then as we toured on, we got to this ridge where you crest to a view of Long's Peak, which is the highest peak in this area, and he just jumped out of the car. This isn't elderly llama and he's running down the mountainside and he says Kailash Kailash which is the most sacred mountain in the world it's in Tibet and so he was making that kind of um, association if you will and it was just a really beautiful moment but I think the moment that really illustrates the preciousness of being in the presence of a llama is the word llama means teacher and so anyone that is a Tibetan Buddhist llama will have spent many years doing philosophical studies and at least three years, sometimes 12 or 20 years in meditation retreat. And it changes them as a person so that they're more compassionate and more in tune to others. And uh, their energy is indescribable to be in their presence. And an example of that is uh, Garchen Rinpoche, who as a young man was in prison during China's Cultural Revolution in Tibet. And he was in prison for 20 years. And uh, his crime was he was a Buddhist practitioner. And uh, during that time, he used his time in prison to transform his mind and his heart. He befriended his captors who guarded the prison. He gave his meager food rations to his um, inmates that he shared the cells with. And he really worked on his meditation practice. And you can feel that he has no hatred for his captors or for the Chinese. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And I got to experience this directly direct love and sort of intuition that he has. When I was in a retreat and a group retreat in Santa Fe, New Mexico one year, um, our group was on a break out in the courtyard and Garchin Rinpoche wasn't anywhere near at that time. And my phone rang and it was my sister calling me to break the sad news that my older sister had been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's or ALS disease. So a, a crisis moment, right? And um, after that conversation, the teachings were getting ready to resume. And so we all got in line to go back into the temple. And Garchin Rinpoche came from behind. He couldn't see me. He didn't know, you know, there's, again, I'm in a line of people. So he couldn't even see my face. And he just walked right up to me from behind me, tapped me on the shoulder, and said some things to me in Tibetan. His translator translated it as, I need you to move your tent so that you're camped right outside of my retreat hut because my energy will help heal what you're dealing with right now. And I was just blown away. Like, how did he know that? And so I think that's a real great illustration of the joy of being in the presence of these people. Very special. Could you tell us about spending two months a year in solitary retreat? 
Yeah. Um, you know, for a lot of people, that idea is kind of like scary or horrifying. I know in the West, when we talk about going into retreat, most people um, think of that as, well, either I'm having a business retreat and we're all getting together right. and we're going to pow out some ideas or work through some problems, or maybe I'm having a personal retreat and I'm going to go to some seaside villa and hang out and read a book and just be away from society, right? <clears throat> This is not that kind of retreat. So this is um, a meditation retreat um, that's designed to follow a systemic um, or systematic uh, process um, over time. So um, for two months a year, I would go to a retreat center in California and uh, live in silence and follow a, a strong um, kind of schedule on getting up very early in the morning and meditating and doing prayers. And, and it's a very powerful experience. So the first week is really the hardest, you know, so when people kind of cringe at the idea of being alone and it's, it's very beautiful. You get over that first week, it's like anything, you know, when you're doing something new, you have to adjust to it, right? A new job or whatever. And um, you get through that first week and your mind starts to settle and you just you see a lot of your stuff arise which is good because you need to process that um but also you just develop this more vast way of being um that's very beautiful and i think you're able to connect with others when you leave retreat better because you've really developed some insights into the human condition and so i find it very beautiful and empowering and inspiring uh, and it's really worth doing. Uh, I think that's how we develop as human beings is to take time out in order to return to society to be a better person and maybe help others. So you invest two months every year in doing this? Yeah. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, with my job, when I got my year-round job with the Park Service, um, <laughs> I took a, a leap of faith and I said, you know, um, I'll only take this job if you give me two months off a year. And at that time, my particular motivation was to travel to the Himalayas. So I spent 12 years, those two months a year, going all over Asia. And then um, I was waiting for a retreat center in California to be built. It was in process. And so once that was completed, then I switched over and started spending my time in retreat then. That was a smart time to ask for that. It was. It was actually the best career decision I ever made because I've been all over the world and had some great experiences because I've had time for work and time for play. And that's more time than most people take off for themselves in a year. I mean, most people can't, somehow can't figure out how to do that. Yeah. Well, it was a risk for me, but, you know, I, again, coming that close to death as a young person kind of defined my life and what my values were. And it wasn't about climbing the ladder for me and it wasn't about the money. It was about the experiences I can get in life. So tell us about your inspirational speeches and book presentations for companies, outdoor and conservation groups, retirement homes, religious institutions, and book clubs. <laughs> well, of course, it varies with the nature of the group, right? Um, I do enjoy talking to book clubs um, because it's so um, personable. You know, you're more in a, a small group situation and you get some really uh, interesting questions. Uh, sometimes things I've never even pondered and I have to really stop and think about that. And I, I do value that. But even talking to large groups, I, I find it really rewarding. Um, for a lot of authors, that's challenging because uh, they may not feel like they are comfortable with public speaking. But I have 30 years of public experience public speaking experience with the National Park Service. So that's not a particularly traumatic thing for me to get up in front of a group, but I always try and tailor my talks to the group. So I might talk specifically just about my mountaineering accident and how that affected me. I might talk about how um, world travel or hiking down certain trails can lead to transformative experiences and new insights into how to live in the world or what I've learned from my tragedy. So I do tailor that, but all of my talks will have the message of life is short and follow your dreams and please look inward and see what you need to heal so that you can enjoy life the most. So you do these talks in person or do you do some of them on Zoom? Um, most of them in person. Of course, this last year that hasn't been the case. So sometimes in Zoom. So it, again, it just depends on the place and the situation and the opportunity.
Could you elaborate a little bit on becoming an Amazon best-selling author? I think it's really important to have a compelling story. So I do have that to my advantage. I mean, having a survival story is very popular and um, it's definitely a riveting story of surviving against all odds. So I think that helps a lot, but it also takes a lot of work in terms of uh, marketing and uh, just kind of getting the word out and doing public talks, things of that nature. So I, I feel very fortunate in that regard. You said some of your readers we're expecting a pure adventure book. Yeah, so I, I always find it a little interesting. Uh, you know, I read each and every review that folks write. I'm intrigued by what people have to say about it. And, you know, I do think that there's a, the, a percentage of audiences that are just looking for the hairy mountaineering story. And, you know, I, yay, I got out alive kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that's what I was originally just writing. And um, when I was processing this to kind of heal my trauma, I actually sent a draft out to my aunt and she's a, a professional sort of personal coach. And she called me up and she said, oh no, you are not finished, you've just begun. And she said, you need to talk more about death and how your encounter with death impacted your life. Mm -hmm. And so um, that became two thirds of the book, uh, which you know surprised me, but that actually was the healing process, that part of the book. And so while I certainly get readers that only want that adventure book, um, you know, that, that's fine if that's all they want, but the book is more than that. And I felt it was important to talk about our traumas because I think when people undergo um, some sort of survival incident, a mountain climbing accident, or they're come back from war, they've been traumatized. And the story isn't just the story of the moment. The story is about how we as humans are transformed by these tragedies and these experiences. And so I put everything out there raw and honest um, because I felt like that was an important part of the story to share. And so, you know, some people don't want all the details, but again, that's the real nature of a survival story is the aftermath of it. So I've also received though, a lot of feedback from people that that's been the meat of the story that has helped them personally. And again, that's where I take the reward is um, helping those folks in whatever way I can. I think so too, having read it, I think you need both parts. Mm -hmm. I think so too. And you know, it's the direction my life took. So I don't want to apologize my life went this way because you know, I had this accident and this shaped me in this way. Then I went and followed these dreams and those dreams shaped me this way and things just kind of unfold. And that's maybe the beauty of life is we don't know where it's going to go. And it's always an adventure. If your book is made into a movie, who would you want to play your part? So actually, there's been a documentary film made recently of um, my story. And oh, really? uh, yeah, it's called Our Town Unfiltered um, Woman in Estes Park. So it's, it's a local movie. It's available on uh, demand on Laku TV and on indie movies, um, later other places. But it's not a Hollywood movie. I do think it'd make a great Hollywood movie. Um, and if that were to be the case, Without doubt, my preference would be to have uh, Daisy Ridley uh, play my part. Um, I saw her play in uh, the Star Wars, Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. And in that movie, I really related to how she portrayed that character she was playing. She was this strong, confident, fit woman who could take on the world. And that's very much how I felt when I was skiing the John Muir Trail and who I was in my 20s. So that would be the person I would choose. Are you working in any upcoming books? I'm dabbling in some ideas um, for some other books and I'm typing up some notes, but I'm not ready to let, um, let it out of a hat just yet. Uh, it'll be a while before it comes out. Um, I, will, I will say that it's um, gonna be a collection of uh, stories in the great outdoors. Oh, that looks, oh, I'll look forward to that. Okay. Yeah. I think it's important to reflect on your story, on your audience, and on the purpose of why you're writing a book. And again, to put every ounce of energy, your heart and your soul into every page. I know I did that and that was important for me personally because I, I really wanted to tell uh, a powerful story. And so I think kind of putting yourself into that mindset is important as a writer. And of course, I'm speaking from a nonfiction point of, or a fiction, excuse me, nonfiction point of view. 
And, and I would also encourage writers, you know, if they're getting frustrated with the whole publishing industry is very challenging, as you well know, everybody knows, um, to consider self-publishing. And then if one takes that course, there's a lot of different options through self-publishing and really do the smart math about when you might actually break even in sales. I think that's critical. And I think the lesson that I could have put into practice, but I, I learned it later, is uh, really think hard about that title. So I love the title of my book and I would keep that, but I would probably change my subtitle because the title of one's book needs to capture the essence of the book and the story, of course, but also thinking about it from a marketing point of view is really important for sales. So I would do more homework on that and I would advise new writers to think about those little things that can make a huge difference in the end. You know, you might change that part because I thought that perfectly like, described what you what the book was, it was where it was going. I think I would change the subtitle to um, be a true story of adventure, survival, and transformation, because I think tragedy oh, okay. has mixed feelings for people. You have a whole section on your website talking about your charitable contribution. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so when I actually decided to publish the book, I was thinking long and hard about why I was doing this. I wrote the book to heal myself and then I released it to inspire others and to help others. And I didn't want my book to be all about me, right? I, I wanted to have it make an impact everywhere it went. And so instead of taking the royalties from it and pocketing that money, which sure could be nice, um, that's not what I'm about. I, again, I wanted to benefit others. So. I looked deeply at, well, where do I wanna put those monies? And I thought about how my mind has saved my life and helped me get through chronic pain and, and meditation has been very valuable. And so I, I wanted to donate to an organization that can teach people how to work effectively with their minds. And uh, so I'm donating it to the Drikun Kagyu lineage of um, Tibetan Buddhism um, for that very purpose. Like, hosting lamas to give teachings, to teach people to meditate, um, to help nuns in India. Uh, so I, I feel really good about that. So yeah, I'm not making a penny off of it. The journey starts as a ski trip. So this is myself at 22 on the John Muir Trail with my 35 pound backpack and ice axe. And then the accident uh, again happened in the winter time. So this image doesn't show um, Mount Whitney's North Face in the winter because uh, it's hard to get pictures in the winter and I was trying to stay alive so I didn't bother to take photos. Uh, but you can see our descent route and where we camped and then our escape route through the Whitney Russell Coal. So if you can imagine this all covered with snow. And then to carry that on further, the next image shows um, the rest of our descent route. So from the summit of Whitney down to the trailhead, um, we had to descend 4,700 vertical feet over seven miles, you know, with severe injuries to my pelvis and back. And I had gangrene because it took so long to get to the hospital. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, it was a really powerful experience. And I guess I would do want to share one last story, maybe in the hopes that your listeners can help me find the man that I'm looking for. So I'll explain okay. this. So um, after my accident, I've spent at least 30 years tracing down all the people that have made a difference in my life. As I mentioned earlier, one of the lessons I learned is expressing gratitude. And so uh, I eventually found my urologist because um, I had nerve damage to my bladder and whatnot. And it took me 30 years to find him, but I tracked him down. But there's one man I haven't found. So what happened is when I got to the trailhead after this incident is uh, we're at the Whitney Russell, excuse me, the Mount Whitney um, trailhead and it's called Whitney Portal above Lone Pine, California. And this is in spring in 1982. So there aren't many people at that time of the year and that particular time period in history going up there. And um, my skiing partner, Ken, dashed out when he heard the first car and asked him to give us a ride to the hospital. And surprisingly, they said no, um, which is shocking because we, we were covered in blood. We looked like we were, well, I was near dying. So anyway, um, that was disappointing, but then, the next car that came in uh, stopped and the man ran out of his car. He was probably in his 20s or 30s at that point in time. 
And he came over to me and I remember he stroked my hair. It was covered in blood and said, it's going to be okay. And he literally picked me up in his arms, carried me to his car. He and his wife were from Utah and they were moving to California. So they had arrived, but not gotten to their destination. They were taking a scenic side trip that day. He unloaded his car, everything. They had all their belongings in this little passenger car. He left his wife and their infant at the trailhead and put myself and my skiing partner in the car and drove us down to the nearest small hospital in Lone Pine very gently. And then he carried me into the emergency room and I've lost his contact information that got lost in the ER. And there was nothing I want more than to find this man and to personally thank him for his great kindness. So that's unfinished business that I still have. So I share that story in case that person is out there and can reach out to me. Again. Hopefully they'll turn up. Hopefully they'll find him. Yeah, but it's a great story about, um, you know, humanity helping and not helping when people are in dire need. And so I think it illustrates an important lesson.